My name is David Hicks. I'm told that this is going to be, uh, I'm going to stand here for a minute while I just introduce our topic, and then I'm going to sit down and invite you to speak to the topic, okay? Uh, I, I'm going to start with a question, because some of you have read uh, this article I wrote. Uh, have it, has anybody read the book, Norms and Nobility? Does that make any sense? No, okay. Um, that's, a, that's a book I wrote when I was younger than any person in this room. Is anybody here younger than 28? <laughs> no, okay. So I'm saying that to you so that you understand over the course of a lifetime, some of my ideas have changed. Uh, we don't think the same things now that we thought when we were 28, my thinking, and, for, and partly because I wrote the book before I had really done much teaching. My first teaching assignment was at the Naval War College, right? So I was teaching all senior captains and commanders in the U.S. Navy. So it was a completely different experience when I started teaching younger people. But I wrote the book about teaching younger people. Does that, am I speaking too fast? No, okay. Don't be shy to tell me to speak more loudly or slow down. It comes kind of very differently uh, younger than 28. You are. No. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, oh, oh. I'm surprised that all the ladies didn't raise their hand and say, I'm younger than 28. <laughs> you think? Okay. Um, now, the question I want to ask you, just sort of think about, is classical education still possible? Now, when we say classical education, at least in the English-speaking world, often if you talk to someone about, oh, he's getting a classical education, what it often means is he's studying Latin and Greek, the classics. And if you major in the classics at the university, you study Latin and Greek, usually, right? And that's not what I mean by classical education. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean, and then we can have a discussion about whether that's still possible or what are the elements of classical education that we still use, and what are the elements of classical education that we should still use, but no longer use, right? Where did the whole school project begin? In terms of, we have a school, here's a school. Did this always exist? Where did it start? Where was the seed for the school planted? Any thoughts? That's such an Estonian answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was planted in ancient Greece, oh. <laughs> specifically in Athens, okay? That's very far off. That's very far off, and it wasn't started in Tallinn. Uh, I thought you meant this particular school, that's why. No, I, I understand. I, I didn't phrase my question correctly. You know, the Romans had a great expression when they were teaching rhetoric or writing or speaking. They said, speak not so that you are understood, but so that you cannot be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to teach your students, to write and speak so they cannot be misunderstood. And I failed the test by asking the question I did. Okay, what I want to say is th this whole project of schools started in ancient Greece. And it was continued by the ancient Romans, and then it was picked up by the Christians. St. Basil of Caesarea wrote a whole treatise about it in a letter he wrote to a young man, right? And it was carried on through the Middle Ages until the 19th century. Now, I'm interpreting everything, so you can disagree with my interpretation. But that's what we all do. Everything we do is interpretation. The reason we have so many different Christians in the world is that 
everyone interprets the Gospels, interprets the words of Christ, interprets the history of the church in their own way. And I would submit that we all interpret our own lives constantly. Our lives are a narrative, a story. And that story, only because we continue to tell that story and we have the memory of that story, do we really have continuity as human beings? I referenced the book, that first book I wrote, Norms and Nobility. I read that book now and it's like, I can't remember writing that. I no longer think that. But it's because I know, because I have a story of myself that grew up, went to the university, went into the Navy, began teaching, and wrote that book. That book was written because of a failure in my life. I was hired by a foundation in Atlanta, Georgia to study American education and propose an improvement to the curriculum that was being used in most schools. I, they were very generous, they paid me well, they flew me all over America, I visited hundreds of schools, I sat in hundreds of classrooms, some wonderful, some not so wonderful, and at the end of the year, I wrote a paper, like a white paper, for the foundation proposing the changes they'd asked me to. But the changes I proposed were all, my thesis was very simple. In the 19th century, the Europeans confused us. The Germans played with our minds and they destroyed classical education. Okay, now I'm, I'm interpreting things and <laughs> don't be offended. But that was my thesis and I said, if we're going to return to how schools were organized and the purpose of teaching and the methods of teaching, if we're gonna re return to those classical methods which were in place for 2,500 years, we need to change, we need to tear up the German idea and return to a classical idea. Because the Germans, as you might know, they had a profound influence on education in the 19th century. In many ways, they reinvented it. And they were brilliant. I mean, our universities are all modeled after those universities. Okay. How many Germans here? Okay, all right. Well, I, I might not offend anybody. Uh, now, so, uh, I told you I wrote this out of failure because when, after I made my presentation, the members of the foundation and those who heard the presentation completely rejected it. In fact, the head of the foundation said to me, we have invested many thousands of dollars in your doing this all year. We flew you all over America, and now you give us something we can't even use. There's no way we're gonna go back to a classical education, okay? So I went home to my new wife, who was six months pregnant with our first child. I had no job, and I thought, I've lost a whole year of my life, and I've done something that isn't acceptable. So I sat down, and I wrote the book. Because if I don't write a book about this, five years from now, I'll forget it all. And the book is all I'm gonna have to show for this year, right? So I wrote the book, I sent it off to an old friend of mine who actually is an archon in the Greek church in New York, he was a publisher in New York, and I said, do you think anybody in New York would be interested in publishing this book? And he called me up and he said, I think we would like to publish your book. And I was shocked because his publisher only published art books and social science books. And my book, one of my criticisms is, is that social science has taken over education. And we need to, I'm not against social science, 
but I don't think it should be running our schools. So I was shocked, and he said, we're going to have to publish this book without going through the normal channels. Because in a big publishing house, you usually have the publisher, and then you have a board like this room full of editors. You'd all be editors. You'd be the anthropology editor. You'd be the psychology editor. You'd be the sociology editor. Everybody would have a specialty, and they would be working with manuscripts in that area. You would bring to the whole group the two or three manuscripts you thought were best in your area and try to persuade them we should, we should publish these books. And at the end of the year, Prager would publish, Prager was the name of the publisher, they would publish maybe 20 books that year. And the editors would all agree, these are the books we want to publish. Because my book was completely different from their other books and was pretty much an attack on social science, my friend George knew that it wasn't going to be successful in that meeting. So he took it directly to the publisher. The publisher, the person in charge, read the book and he said, you're right, we will never be able to publish this book, but I want to publish it too. So they went ahead and published it without telling the editorial board. I'm just telling you this funny little story about how publications work. When it came out, they didn't even know it was published until they published their catalog. Every year, a publishing house publishes a catalog and lists all the books they have published that year. And when it came out, all the editors, of course, went to look for their books. And then they were reading the catalog. What is this book, Norms and Nobility? We never discussed such a book. Why is this in this catalog? And. Uh, they were so angry with my friend George, who was the psychology editor, they wouldn't even speak to him. He would come to the office and they would pretend he wasn't even there. But that year, at the end of the year, uh, the, the American Library Association gives an award for uh, the best, in their opinion, the best book in each area psychology, anthropology, sociology, education, etc. Okay. And my book won the award that year. That surprised no one more than it did me. I was like, you've got to be kidding me, because there are lots of books published in education. I still don't know why it won the award, but after it won the award, it was the only book that this publishing house published that year that won an award. And so suddenly my friend George was a hero at Prager and everybody talked to him. Uh, the reason it's so important to win that award, by the way, is that libraries in America, there are thousands of them, right? Every little town has a library. And the librarians, they don't read all of the books they buy. They go by lists that are sent to them. And this is a list that they all buy. The American Library Association, when they publish their list, the librarians all buy it. So when the book was first published, there were only two or three hundred copies of it made because th the assumption was no one is going to buy this book. When I won the award, they suddenly had to print thousands of copies of the book. Anyway, that's the funny story. All right, now we're going to talk about classical education. How many of you had a, have had a chance to read this? Did you just get it? Was it just given to you? Well, so you haven't had a chance to read it. Here. Yeah, we, I've got some extra copies. I don't know that we, if you haven't read it, there's no point in our talking about it, except I might refer to it, okay? And does anyone else need a copy? That, Yes, one, uh, Classical Education 101. I, I, I'm going to do that. Here are some more copies if you want. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm standing up here. I want to give you a very, I hope, succinct uh, uh, lesson in, what class, in, in my view of what my interpretation of classical education, right? How many of you are 
familiar with or have studied ancient history? So some of you, okay, that tells me how much I kind of need to tell you about the ancient world. Okay, the schools came from Greece. In ancient Greek, there is one word that can be translated both culture and education. And when you're a translator, like I am, when I see that word in an ancient text, I have to decide, am I going to write in English culture or education? I have to decide that from the context, right? That word is paideia, paideia. And the, the whole idea of education, I love that confusion in Greek, because it is the culture that teaches everyone. We are learning all of the time just by being Estonian, by living here. Our language is full of learning for us. Think of the words that we use that have their various meanings and how we put them together. Last night we listened to music at the Repart Center. Beautiful music, but that was culture, but it was also a wonderful education in the variations of Gregorian chant, right? Everything you do in culture is also educating you. And one of the most famous lessons, one of the most famous speeches that were get, was given in the ancient world was a funeral oration, which the head of Athens, Pericles, gave at the end of the first year of the Peloponnesian War. And in that oration, he describes Athens. It's, it, he's praising Athens to the sky. But in the middle of that oration, he says, Athens is the education of Greece. Athens is the school of Greece. We are the ones who teach Greeks what it is to be Greek, right? So uh, hold that idea. It's very important that culture and education in the classic, if we're making a list of what is classical education, the first thing it is, is it identifies education with culture. And in the schools, in the ancient schools, the school taught the culture. That's what it was about. Let's teach the culture. And we continue to do that, at least in America, and I assume in Estonia, down to about 200 years ago, 150 years ago. The culture, do you all know the English word norm? Norms, okay? There were norms, and every culture had norms for everything. We had norms for writing a correct English sentence. We had norms for how to solve a quadratic equation. There was a norm for how to brush your teeth. There's a norm for what to do when a woman comes into the room and sits down at the table. The norm was for the men to stand up, right? But cultures have different norms, but the norms are that's what education was. So the second idea I want you to think of is education was about teaching children the norms for that society. And there was a norm for everything. How to tie your tie. When not to wear a tie. Right? How to address, you know, when I went to a, a little boy's school, the, mas the teachers were called masters. And you always referred to them as sir. And you always said, Mr. So-and-so, right? Those were norms for that school. Now, uh, and if you were to study to become a teacher in America, and I, I assume in other places, but in America, up until maybe 100 years ago, where did you go to school? Do you know? You went to normal school. Normal school, that's where you learn the norms, because you're going to have to teach your students the norms. And the norms are, some teachers, some schools were very comprehensive in the way they teach. They would teach you how to, in my school, we were taught how to do everything, right? But public schools were, they didn't teach you how to brush your teeth, right? 
when I went into the Navy, the first thing you do is for three months, you go to a school, in my case, the officer training school, and every day they just tell you the norms of the Navy. There's an expression in the US Navy. There's a right way, and a wrong way, and a Navy way. Do it the Navy way, right? You have to relearn all those norms that you think, you come in there with your own set of norms, but the Navy is gonna say, uh-uh, these are the norms for the Navy, okay? That's, that was the world we lived in. All people lived in for over 2,000 years. And teachers were there to teach the norms. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about how they did that in the classical school. And remember, you're thinking, can classical education still be taught? Can we still, can we even agree on what our norms are in Estonia? And can we teach them? Uh, in America, that's extremely difficult because we have been denorming for over 50 years. And if you want an argument in the United States, just propose a norm. We're all gonna do this. <laughs> no, no, we're not all gonna do that. You know, this is how you're supposed to wear your hair. Are you kidding me? I wear my hair any way I want to wear my hair. This is how you're supposed to dress. No, no, I can dress any way I want, right? In my day, the only people would, who had got tattoos were Navy people, right? Now everybody gets a tattoo, and if you go into the Navy, they don't let you get a tattoo. See, the norms have completely changed. I'm just making a joke, sorry. Okay. Um, is this gonna mess up your, yeah, it is gonna mess. I've gotta wear this thing all the time. I'm gonna take them, I'm gonna put this in my shirt. You see how the technology governs our lives? We, these guys, they're, they're, he's really running this classroom. Then they give you an example? All right. Um, Oh my goodness, there are so many. A simple thing like making your bed. There was a Navy way of making your bed. You, you tuck, I'll tell you, you tuck everything in, and if, if a commanding officer walks in and he can't bounce a quarter off of your bed, a quarter is a coin, it hasn't been, it's not tight enough, okay? Um, well, the obvious, the thing that you all know is if I, if I pass a senior person, okay, I salute him and then he salutes back to me, okay? I don't, if, if you walk by a senior person without saluting, you're going to end up in the brig, right? I mean, it's very serious. Uh, if I want to pass a senior person, in other words, you're my commanding officer or you're just a little senior to me and you're walking very slow on the path and I'm in a hurry and I want to pass you, I walk up to you and say, by your leave, sir, or by your leave, ma'am, and then you give me permission to pass you. I mean, uh, everything is governed by norms. Now, except in a society that is denorming, right? So my first thought to you is, are there sufficient, is there sufficient agreement in Estonia about what your norms are so that you can teach them. In America, that's very difficult because there isn't that kind of general agreement about norms, partly because we are such a multicultural society. People come from all different parts of the world with different norms. And so if you put forward a norm in America, there'll be great resistance because you're not respecting people who came from Bangladesh or Mexico. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm sort of answering the question for you. Is classical education possible? Classical education, this is how I defined it in my book. Classical education is for a spirit of inquiry and a form of instruction. A spirit of inquiry and a form of instruction that is concerned with the development in the young person of style through language 
and character through myth. That's my succinct little definition of classical education. It has nothing to do about learning Greek and learning Latin. Because of course, in ancient Greek, they learn Greek. In, in, Ro in, La in Rome, they learn Latin, right? That just goes without saying. But in a, in a classical education, you don't have to learn those things. You learn Estonian, you learn Russian, you might learn English. You learn whatever your culture Okay, uh, you want me to say it again? The terms. I, I'm going to, good, good. I will, I'm going to unpack uh, okay. that definition. And so just, you will. Just, just, just repeat and then unpack, okay? Because we just missed it. <laughs> I'll slow down when I do that. Okay, first I said it's a spirit of inquiry. Have anybody here read Plato's dialogues? That's it. Okay. Well, obviously, you have not received a classical education. You cannot <laughs> say, I am classically educated without having read Plato. But it, Plato's dialogues are, nowadays, thanks to our German friends, when a person, a thinker writes, he sits down alone and writes what is called a, system, a s systematic philosophy. He begins with his core ideas, he sets them out, and he writes them out and defends his systematic philosophy. In the ancient world, that's not how people thought. You were in a dialogue with people. And the dialogue always started, you know, always pertained to questions. <coughs> Even when I talked to the class two days ago about Marcus Aurelius, we read it now as just a lot of thoughts. But in fact, uh, the French scholar Pierre Hadot he uh, discovered, if you like, that Marcus was actually writing in response to questions. All we have is his answers. We don't have the questions, but we can guess what the questions are. Because, because the, the answers tell us sort of what he was concerned about. Death being one. Okay, so it's a spirit of inquiry. And driven usually by questions. And then it's, it's a form of instruction that to, the spirit of inquiry, does that make sense? The spirit, uh, s help, help us with an Estonian word. Could you help us with the spirit of inquiry? Don't ask me. <laughs> it's the spirit of inquiry. It's a, it's a, it's a, questioning, sp a questioning spirit. Thank you, great. And a form of instruction. Can anyone give us a good Estonian translation of a form of instruction? A, a, method, a method of instruction. Okay, good. Uh, now, that form of instruction was, as I said, they were accomplishing two things with it. One was to teach style through language. And by style, I don't mean how you dress, okay? Style is how you present yourself in language. You know, every, all of us present ourselves in, in a different way in our language. Some of us are more formal. Some of us are very informal. Some of us are very colloquial. Some of us are profane. In my country, increasingly, you hear people, just common people, using words that would have made my mother blush, right? Constantly. But that's part of our denorming. They don't want to be told you can't use those, you can't speak to another person that way, or you can't use those words. But rhetoric, and, and, and this was called rhetoric, right? The ancients called it rhetoric. We still call it rhetoric is how you use the language, how you speak. And I, and I was referring to a principle of rhetoric at the beginning when we talked about the Roman instruction. You don't speak to be understood. You speak not to be misunderstood. That's a principle of rhetoric, right? And so the teacher, if the teacher is 
grading an essay or, and, and in the ancient world, most of it was oral. Here's a, did you know that until Ambrose, St. Augustine went to Milan and he saw Ambrose reading. Until then, he had never seen a person read without speaking the words. Everything was spoken out loud. And if, I, if you were reading to yourself, you'd say, I'm now old enough to look back on over half a century of the world of education. You'd never think of just reading that without saying it. Okay? So rhetoric in the ancient world was spoken. Now we regard rhetoric as both spoken and written. We can read it without saying it. Uh, <clears throat> there's a Navy joke since we started talking about the Navy. The Marine Corps is a part of the Navy in the United States. We always make fun of the Marines, jarheads. And when I had my Marine Corps students, I would say, I know you're not going to be able to read this. Your lips would get tired. Okay, they, they don't read to them. So they can only read out loud, right? It was just a joke. Okay, so what you have here is this uh, st uh, st method of instruction that focuses very much on language because that's how they learn style. That's how you present yourself. Now remember in ancient Athens, if you were a citizen, you were a male of a certain age, right? But you, you weren't elected to serve in capacities. Do you know how, you know how the leaders in Athens were selected? by lottery. Every citizen had to be prepared to become a, a leader for one year. And it was done by lottery. Think of the, think of the, uh, think of what an emphasis, how important education was in that country. What if you chose your leaders in Estonia by lottery? Every school would have to step up its game, right? Because you, you might end up, as a teacher, you might end up having as your leader the most stupid student in your class. That is, and the importance of rhetoric is everything was decided based upon public speaking. So if you wanted a law passed, you had to go to the Areopagus, the place where they passed the laws, and make a speech and convince all of your fellow citizens of what you were saying. So if you weren't a good public speaker, if you couldn't speak so as not to be understood but so as not to be misunderstood, you would not be an effective leader. Huge. Now, when Socrates was there, he, had, he was an unusual teacher, let's say, because most of the teachers, and he, he criticized these teachers, he called sophists. Have you ever heard that expression, sophists? In English, we have a term we refer to as sophistical. Sophistical means clever argument, but lacking good sense, basically. Okay, A clever argument that doesn't have much sense in it. But the sophists taught their students how to make clever arguments and they didn't care whether or not. In fact, their rule was, I'm going to teach you how to make the weakest argument appear to be the strongest. And Socrates had huge problems with that because he was more interested in getting the right answer rather than just an answer that sounded good or that was persuasive, right? Okay, so the first thing was a focus on language an effort to teach uh, style, your personal style, through how you speak, how you use the language, how persuasive you are, how logical you are, right? The second goal of education in the ancient world, and, uh, and this is all classical education, is you're interested in teaching character or conscience, if you prefer, 
through myth, through stories. Okay, so now in Athens, what was the great myth? Okay, wait, wait, before you answer that question, what is the great myth here at St. John? Now myth, myth does not mean a fairy tale or something like that. A mythos, myth is a direct translation from Greek. A mythos was a story that came, contains commanding truths, norms, norms that you need to follow. What? The, what, the, you, uh, the question was, what is the great? Well, the what is the yeah? What so is the great my book? My version is the gospel, but I might be mistaken. The gospel. Yes. Absolutely. That is your. I mean, if you're uh, if you're a Christian society or you're a Christian school, the great narrative, the great story is, is in the Bible. If you're Jewish, the great story is the Tanakh, right? If you're uh, Muslim, the great story is the Quran, right? These are your big, big stories, and everybody studies that story. What was it, do you think, in Socrates' time? Students even memorize the whole thing, which is hard to believe. Homeros, exactly. It's Homer. The Iliad and the Odyssey, they committed it to memory. It was the standard for that civilization. And when they were reading it, or when they were studying it, it was norming them. This is how you behave. This is not how you behave. When Agamemnon insists on taking Achilles' mistress, because he's the king, hubris, very, very bad. You don't want to behave like that. When Achilles refuses to go into the field and fight with his countrymen because his feelings are hurt and he's angry, very bad. You, you don't want to be like Achilles in that moment, right? That book is on every page full of examples of behaviors that you should copy or not, or, or not copy. Education, the Greek word for it was mimetic. It was imitation. And it was, you imitated the actions you saw in these stories that formed your character. Character, do you have that word here? What would be the Estonian word for character? Character. So we have two words, the English type word, okay. Uh, I know it's, well, I know the French word. I'm not sure, actually, that's a good question. No, I don't think it's Greek. Um, it's the same root. It's the same root. Does anyone else know whether it's, I, I don't know if it's Greek. But, so there was this whole ethical, moral element to the education, a classical education. Now, there are three things that you learned when we talk about norms. There are three ways of talking about that in an ancient school. Logos, nomos, and atheia. The logos were the rules of God. They were the preeminent rules. Have you read, have you done Antigone? Okay. Antigone, the king of uh, uh, Thebes had, had promulgated a law, a nomos, and he said, no one can bury the corpse of an enemy of the state. We leave those corpses for the dogs. Antigone, her brother, came to fight against the state, and he died. And she broke the nomos by burying the body. In other words, she followed a logos because the gods insist, demand, that every dead person be properly buried. Okay? So you have logos, you have nomos. Now the nomos or the nomoi were typically differed from city to city. And if you walked into Athens or Sparta or any other Greek city, right, Megara, whatever, the nomoi of that city were often engraved on the walls by the gate. 
So if you were visiting, you would know, here are the laws. I've got to keep these laws. These are the norms, the nomos of, of, the, of this city. And then there are the ethea, from which we get the modern word in English anyway, ethics. The ethea are not written. They're just agreed upon by people. They're, we have certain ethical understandings, right? They don't have to be turned into law. They're just things we don't do, or we do because of our ethical uh, understanding. Now, I don't know if you heard my talk yesterday, but I used, a, I think, a good example of ethics. Normally, in, in a society like yours or mine, common people, everybody knows how it's appropriate to be with a child, right? We know if you're behaving inappropriately with a child, if you're taking advantage of that child. Now, in that kind of society, I can hug a child and no one looks at me like, oh, w what's going on there, right? So that was an ethea. It didn't have to be written down. But because we have had uh, egregious, terrible examples of adults who have abused children, most recently in our country, the scandal of Catholic priests doing this, which is shocking, now we have laws which say the nomos, they're nomos, you can't touch a child. Even though when I go to Mexico or other cultures, it's perfectly all right. And the Mexicans, if they, they hear about the American law and it's like, what? You don't, you don't understand what's appropriate and what's not appropriate? You have to have a law that tells you that? Do you understand? Okay. Um, so, I get, what I'm trying to say here is that a classical education involves a real focus on language and you teach style through language. You, you teach the person's style. And in the ancient world, people were respected if they had good style in, in the way they talked. They used appropriate language, they presented it properly. And also, the, 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 the uh, education was very concerned about teaching students how to behave. Moral, moral behavior, right? Those were the two focuses. Now let me ask you a question. How is St. John doing? Is it, is it classical? I mean, d does, it, does it use some of those classical elements? I can't, I, I can't answer the question. <laughs> Our students, are, more or less, are, you're st I mean, yeah, okay, you, you, do you value you value all of your students, of course, but do you, do you particularly value those students who speak well and write well and you teach those, y y y you, you're very focused on how people are writing and speaking? Yes, ma'am. Okay, do you In this way, um, we were trying to um, uh, make them read from early age and to read good, uh, uh, good books, to be inspired by this literature, and we also use the storytelling a lot to, uh, also to instill some ideals or, or good. some character building elements, even with myths or with fairy tales. Good, good. So there are some elements of classical education that you use here and that a lot of schools use because teachers, the teachers I know typically are concerned about how well their students are speaking or writing 
and they do want to use literature that give them good models for behavior, right? Okay, good. That well, but that's good, and that's very classical. You're, it, it, we all, we express ourselves. I'm expressing a part of my being by speaking to you, and how I speak to you. If I am I speaking to you with understanding? Am I speaking to you with sympathy? Am I speaking to you with respect? Or am I not? You asked about Navy protocols. If I'm the commander, I, don't, I, I speak to you like you are peasants, right? I tell you what to do. In the Navy, here's the protocol. In the Navy, if my commanding officer expresses a wish or a desire, I am supposed to receive it as a command. Boy, it would be nice if we had shades on those windows. I rush out and buy shades, right? It, and so if, you were in a se if you're a senior officer, you have to be careful about what you've expressed as a wish, right? That's a protocol. And so that's good. So we're, we're starting to understand now what classical education is. It's this focus upon style and upon the moral development of the child. Now, <coughs> Here's a question for St. John. How much is your teaching of conscience or character tied to the narrative of the Bible? If, if you were a classroom full of 10th grade students, year 10 at St. John, and I were to give you a little test, you're all 10th graders, and I were to ask you 10 fairly simple questions about the Bible, would you all answer the questions correctly? Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if I... Okay, so, so the, Bible, the Bible is one of the fairy tales you use to teach good behavior. Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm putting words in your mouth, yes. No, no not exactly, but uh, okay. it is also, we are trying to focus a lot on the uh, atmosphere, also like the yep. morning prayers, and, and so that it's not only the mind that is at work, but all senses. That's but probably like a quiz on, on Bible facts. I'm not sure how well the students would do. Okay, the f before we come back to the Bible, uh, is the focus on atmosphere, what you call the atmosphere, is that classical? Mm. 
Yes or no? You're nodding yes. I think you're right. <coughs> Remember what I talked about, culture mm -hmm. and education? Those are the things that create a culture in a school, the atmosphere. And you can teach a lot to children through the culture. I once was the, on the board of a school <coughs> that in every classroom, everywhere you saw, there were four words, the same four words. I forget now. Respect. Compassion, um, diligence, honesty, maybe. I, I forget. But that school, they, they said these are, with these, they found four words that for them captured the character of all of their students. And they would constantly talk with their students or read stories that supported those values. But those were the core values of that school. They wanted every student to graduate from that school completely believing in those four values, those four virtues, right? Now to come back to the story of, to come back to the narrative. See, when I ask the question about the Bible, I'm not telling you you have to teach the Bible. But I, I ask that question because it shows you the difficulty we have in the modern world of, of, uh, teaching classical education, of, of doing it the way it was intended. Because we don't all agree on the same text, the same norms. There are different ones. They come to our, us from their homes with different norms. And now, when I say, would they know the Bible? What I'm not saying is that you read the Bible because you're, you have to do certain things. Are they, do they know the story? You know, if I were to ask them for my, my questions would be like these. Okay, what are the Ten Commandments that God gives to Moses? What are the names of the Twelve Apostles? What is the name of the Apostle who betrayed Christ? Uh, who was called the Beloved Apostle? Simple, simple questions that anyone who's read the book would be able to answer. It's not telling people how to behave, it's just telling me, well, they know the story. And then we can read about the story, the good behaviors, the bad story, whatever. The danger in a Christian school, I think, of teaching the Bible, along with myths, fairy tales, other things, is that we are, uh, by doing it that way, we are suggesting that all of these things are on the same level. And if we are a Christian school, that's not really being honest with our students. For us, they're not on the same level, right? Anyway, just a thought. Okay, um, now, another element of a classical education. Are, how's everybody doing? You wanna stand up, it's, we've been here for an hour, oh, what? 45 minutes, an hour. This is over at 3 o'clock. If I don't speak to you until 3 o'clock, they won't give me my money. Okay. So I'm sorry. <laughs> That's the way it is. It's like you. You've got to teach to the end of the day, right? Do they let you go home, you know, an hour early to get your hair done? I don't think so. Yeah. So, that, okay. So 3 o'clock, I promise you, we're all out of here. Okay. Okay. Um, Actually, I've got to make a phone call at 3 o'clock, so we'll make it a little before 3. Another characteristic of classical education is something the French scholar Henri Moreau referred to as the tyrannizing image. The tyrannizing image. Now, what does that phrase suggest to you? Go ahead. Okay, Munchen, say it in English and I'll understand. What, what, what are we thinking a tyrannizing image means? Uh, 
still have, they have some image of classical education, but what is the opposite? I guess this also the, the one of the possibilities out of this circle of classical education. Oh, oh okay, well, a tyrannizing, what we taught, what, what Moreau meant when, by tyrannizing image is that the classical, in classical education, there were certain ideals, human ideals, that you as a teacher wanted all of your students to emulate. The, the ancient philosopher Plotinus, he said, be always at work chiseling your own statue. Be always at work chiseling your own statue. And the statue, you're ch it's, not a cha pardon me, it's not a statue of self-expression. It's not a statue of, well, I want to be a fireman. I want to be a policeman. I want to be this. No, no. There is a tyrannizing image. There's one thing that everyone is going to be directed at. Remember I mentioned earlier when they read Homer? Who's the, who's the hero uh, in Homer? There's actually not a perfect, but there's only one perfect one. History. He, what? History. The person. Who's the person in Homer? Who would, who would be the tyrannizing? Achilles? No. Because remember, he loses his temper. He, he, has, he has qualities that are part of the tyrannizing image. I would say that the hero is Hector. Hector, and what's interesting about that, if you think about it, is Homer makes the enemy of the Greeks his hero, the good man. Hector is a wonderful husband, a wonderful father. He fights for his country. He dies. Okay? Have you been to Athens, any of you? Okay, so you've been in Constitution Square and you've, and you've seen the bas relief in front of the Parliament building, right? You know the, where the guard changes? What is that bas relief? It is a tyrannizing image. Do you remember what it is? It's a warrior, a Greek warrior, with his helmet and everything dressed out, lying dead. What is our tyrannizing image in the Christian church? Christ on the cross, right? The sacrifice. The Greek the tyrannizing image in front of their constitution, it didn't, they didn't just put it there because they thought it was a pretty picture, right? It's there because that is their tyrannizing image. What is the, you know, pro patria mari, the best thing to do is to die for your country. That is the ultimate, to die as a warrior for your country. For Christians, what is the best thing? What is the ultimate thing? to die for others, right? To sacrifice yourself for others, which is what Christ on the cross, one of the things he accomplished, right? So the tyrannizing image was when they read things, they were interested in, in shaping their students to a particular image. Now if you know anything about art history, you'll understand that Greece went through a period of about 300 years, 200 years, where the statues, statues like the one of, by Praxiteles or Miron, were perfect. The, 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 uh, the uh, Venus de Milo, which is Aphrodite de Milos, right? Have you seen, you know, you know who I mean, the Venus de Milo, right? She's in the Louvre. She is perfect. At least that's what men think, okay? She's perfect. The Greeks were always, at that, during that period of time, they were trying to uh, cre recreate this perfect image. It wasn't until like the fourth or third century, the, known as the Hellenistic period, where they started to do quote unquote realist. When the Italians, during the Renaissance, rediscovered the old classical world, what did they do initially? Think of Michelangelo. They tried to create, they, they saw the human form is beautiful. 
and they tried to recreate that form, that beautiful form. They weren't looking at me or someone else and saying, oh, we're going to carve a statue of Hicks. I mean, who wants a short, fat statue, right? They were looking at something really beautiful. And, and it was in the mind. It was in the mind, okay? Now, that's a tyrannizing image. That's what they wanted to do. Imitate something that was perfect. You can now see how the Christians just inherited and accepted this tradition, but they just, they accepted the old wineskins, but they poured new wine into it, right? Christ was the tyrannizing image. But that's a part of classical education. In the ancient world, <coughs> I said you had Homer. Do you know who the Romans read a lot of? Plutarch. Have you ever heard of Plutarch? You, you do, oh, good, good, oh, great. Uh, <coughs> Plutarch wrote a whole series of books called The Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans. They were comparative studies. And he would take a Greek, like um, Lycurgus of Sparta, and a Roman, like uh, uh, Focon. No, no, no. Uh, Oh, who was the Roman lawgiver? Anyway, <coughs> they put these, they would, he wrote books, a, a story for both of them. Do you know who, who he wrote those books for? School children. He was a teacher. Plutarch was a teacher, and he wrote those for young people. He, why did he write those for young people? Well, he, he lo that's another Estonian response. I mean, I'm really getting a very clear idea what Estonia is all about. You know, love and yeah, right. No, yes, he loved young people. But actually, Plutarch, I don't know if he loved young people. I, some of my best teachers didn't love me. Uh, <coughs> but but what, why did he write these books for young people? So, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is another uh, uh, title of the book, like... Uh, it's pictures around the table, yes, something like that. Pictures around the table. No, pictures, Spe uh, speeches, spoken. spoken oh, words, speeches, spoken speeches. Words around the table. That particular. Book. Yeah, that's okay. So, we are have. You supposed to sit around the table. No, you can. Okay, <laughs> that's. You're showing me you know something about Plutarch, but actually we have two books by Plutarch or two series of books. Okay. One is called the Comparative Lives of the Greeks and Romans. These are short biographies, and much of what we know about those people, we know because Plutarch wrote these books. Then there's another collection of letters, essays, other things. We call it, it's in English, we call it, well, it's not even English, but it's called the Moralia, which is another bunch of Plutarch's writings, but it's not the same. Why did he write the comparative lives of the Greeks and Romans? <coughs> Uh, basically, uh, come on, guys, I've given you the answer. I mean, it, it, we're talking about classical education, right? He's a, show he's... The what? Show the exactly. And he even writes, if you, re you read the introduction of his books, I mean, my brother and I have already translated three of these comparative lives, right? And they're, you can buy these on Amazon. I'm, I'm not trying to sell my books. Uh, but the point is, is that he even says in his introduction, he said, I'm not going to waste my time writing about the big battles they fought and, and all this stuff. He said, that doesn't interest me. What interests me are the little stories that most people overlook about these people that show their character. That's what interests me. And that's what makes these stories so much fun to read, is because he just glances right over the battles. Yeah, I fought this battle did this big deal. <clears throat> but guess what he said to his servant when his servant said something, right? There's a great story about, we just did Julius Caesar. There's a great story about Caesar as a young man. He's traveling with his cohort of soldiers through Switzerland. And they come into this filthy, filthy village. Probably no more filthy than the villages in Estonia were at that time, right? But you know, the people were living with their pigs, they were, it, was a, it was a primitive, primitive little village. And, the, and his, his lieutenants, his, his you know, 
junior people were around him. And they were making fun of the people in this village. Look at these people, they live like animals. They're disgusting, right? And then one of, his, one of his lieutenants says, you know, even in this village, I'll bet one of them thinks he's number one and wants to rule over all the other people in the village. And Caesar said, you shouldn't be criticizing him. He said, because let me tell you something, I'd rather be number one in this village than number two in Rome. Now, why would Plutarch tell us that story? Think about what that reveals about Caesar's character. He was not going to be number two. He was going to defeat Pompey. He was going to go to Utica. He was going to be number one or dead, right? And Plutarch captures that char his character, his character, that word we keep using, the character in that little story, in that little mythos. I love that story because it reveals so much about Caesar. Okay. Um, no, 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 you don't interrupt the teacher. That's not, a, yeah, <laughs> interrupt. Because I mean, this, this story which you told now, it reveals the hubris that you have as a part of the classical education. And when I'm thinking about it, I have a feeling that actually it's, it's not accidental, uh, rather than that it's really one of the very important parts of the classical education, which has some conflict with Christianity. Would you like to comment on that? Wait, it, I, the last part I missed. Which step uh, on the contract? Which has some, some co uh, conflict with the Christian understanding. Oh. Well, no, that's a good point. And, and St. Basil writes about that. Because he, he writes in defense of reading pagan literature. And if you're a Christian, I'm, I'm sure the Christians read Plutarch. They, they taught it. Basil said you should teach it. But you would put a completely different interpretation to it, you wouldn't say, look what a fantastic, you know, this is what you should be. You should want to be number one, you know, wherever you are, right? That would, the Christians would say, as St. Augustine did, this is why the Roman Empire fell apart. Because it was full of people like Caesar who didn't care about anybody else except himself. In fact, I'm glad you raised that, Mikhail, because uh, my, I was going to sort of my, I'm sort of coming to my conclusion. You know, the Christians taught a completely different set of norms, totally different. Has anybody read the Beatitudes? Sermon on the Mount? Okay. Now, that would be one of my questions for your students. Tell me the Sermon on the Mount. Because in that little sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Okay? We think about those. Those are totally contrary to Greek and Roman norms. If you were a slave, if you were poor in spirit, you were nothing. Who was Aristotle's, what was his tyrannizing image? Who was his ideal man? I'm sorry, ladies, there were no ideal ladies. They were all ideal men. Who was his ideal man? Aristotle's. He called it the magnanimous man. He was a man who felt superior to everybody else. You can still find Greeks like this. He always spoke in a very Greek and deliberate way. And when he talked to you, he talked to you like this. Has anyone ever heard a Greek speak like that? Yeah, you, you feel like suddenly you're a little boy in their classroom and you're being talked down to. But that was Aristotle's magnanimous man. He was a man with great pride, or as the Greeks would say, philatema, right? Philos, love, time, honor. Great love of honor. And you did not, you, with, with a man, a magnanimous man, a man with philatema, Greek even to this day, you don't want to um, treat them with anything but great respect or they'll become angry with you or they'll just walk away from you and ignore you. <coughs> Americans, are we tend to be very informal and we have trouble 
with that personality, and they have trouble with us, right? So when I go to Greece, I go constantly. I always talk like this, and I say, when you, you know, I am an American, and I am expecting you to do this now. The Greeks will love the Russians. Anyway, so the point is, is that there is, even in Aristotle, there was this ideal, but the Christians also had this ideal. And it's really taken, I, I think it's planted right in the Beatitudes. Jesus is turning the whole classical tyrannizing image on its head. And when he gives the Sermon on the Mount, you don't think Jesus understood he was doing that? He was taking, he knew what the tyrannizing image of the Greeks was and the Romans and all the Hellenized Jews. And he was just flipping it right over and say, no, this is not what God wants from you. This is not the tyrannizing image you should have. So, guess what? I'm, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you really. I'm going to let you go fast. Oh, by the way, uh, some of you are probably, maybe, are any of you old enough to remember the good old Soviet days? Does it? Okay, you had. There was a Soviet man, right? I mean, these are new ideas. The Soviets wanted, they taught with a tyrannizing image. It was this ideal man, working man, right, who was working for his country, working for others, and uh, wanted nothing for himself, wanted everything for the collective, for the, for the group, right? Soviet man. Hitler, the fascists, they had, they had, you know, man of iron. They had a tyrannizing image. Think of the statues that were, were made during the uh, Soviet era and during the Nazi era. Do you, do you remember the, the draw? The draw remember, <clears throat> I studied in the Soviet Union for a while. I, I love collecting the posters. Right? The women were like working hard. And they were, they, they, that was their tyrannizing image. And they taught that in their schools because they wanted all of their citizens to emulate, to copy that image and see themselves in that image. So they had also many elements of a classical education. That, that's what education did. Now, uh, look, uh, let me ask you the <laughs> Let's go back to our original question, and, and, the, and I want you to think about it. Is classical education still possible? Are there elements of it that you can still do? Are there elements that you cannot do? And are there elements that you do not do, but you should do? Right? What? You think it's possible? I love it. Very positive Estonian here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really getting the whole Estonian thing. It's very, very positive people. You know, we can do it. We can do it. Uh, we just have to love one another, and we'll get it done. I'm just teasing you. I think, that's, I think it's beautiful. And uh, it's much more Christian than what I'm used to. What, are there elements of it that you are doing or that you can do? Yes. The, you know, I, I think uh, from what I've said, I hope, and from what we talked about, I hope that you see that there are, you see the elements of a classical education in what you're doing. And in, in the school, and I want you to understand those are cla that's classical education. When you ask me at the very beginning, say something about classical education. Do you feel like you've heard, you've learned something about it, or you understand now better what classical education is? You teach, you do teach some elements. What elements do you not teach? Well, okay, I started off by picking on the Germans, right? I, you know, I love picking on the Germans. Uh, what is it that the Germans did to education, do you think? Why do you think I have that sort of, actually, it's not a negative view. I love what the Germans did. But wh why do I say that they really threw over classical education? <coughs> yeah. Like really good. Although 
Yes, <laughs> the Germans did a number of interesting things. One is <clears throat> they took the emphasis, this is my interpretation, they took the emphasis off the individual and the self in the development of the self. And they put it on nature, history. They made the subject the whole important thing. And they wanted, <clears throat> and they really wanted to take a scientific approach to these subjects. They started the whole process of what we call disciplines. Up until the Germans, you studied, you studied subjects. You asked a question, and you sought an answer to the question. What is virtue? Can virtue be taught? Right? Those are big, we used to call them existential type questions. Those are big questions, but there's no specific way of answering it. You have to pull, you can pull from various sources and put forward various ideas to find the answer to that question. <clears throat> the Germans started creating disciplines. What would a, how would an anthropologist answer that question? How would a psychologist answer that question? How would a theologian answer that question? Everything started going into disciplines. Now, <clears throat> my beef with disciplines is first, they're very powerful and they have taught us a lot of things. <clears throat> but they have also resulted in a lot of nonsense coming out of the universities because the sociologist is going to give an answer which is focused on his, his theory, his theoretical mind, but he hasn't consulted the anthropologist, the theologian, the historian, the philosopher. He hasn't pulled all of those, pulled from all of those ideas to find the answer to his question. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but that's, that's why I, when I did my presentation to the, to the uh, Woodruff Foundation, um, they were still thinking in very disciplinary ways. And when I suggested, no, we need to do, we, we need to return to a classical education which focuses on questions, big questions that don't have right or wrong answers, questions that have existential meaning for our students, and questions that have to be answered using many disciplines, if you like, uh, that was just not acceptable. Make sense? Do you have any questions? I'm going to let you all go. Any questions for me? Are there any questions that I haven't answered? I think I've answered every single question you could possibly have. What is the essence of a Christian classical school? What is the, you've, uh, you've given us a very good historical overview of how it all developed and what the methods were, but I know that in, in America you have many Christian classical schools. Oh, yeah. How would you, what's your, your take on that? Well, I think you can probably cobble together my answer from what we've said. Uh, you know, the focus has to be, and I said it yesterday, for a Christian classical school, their narrative, their mythos is the Bible. So in a Christian classical school, in America anyway, the students do read the Bible and they talk about it. It's not all they read, but they might also read Thomas Kempis. They might read St. John Chrysostom. And they might read Friedrich Nietzsche. Right? They'll read everything, but they'll read it with, with, the, with the sense they have a different tyrannizing image, right? Christ is there. Christ, in a, a truly Christian school, classical school, just has a different tyrannizing image. But they also put a great emphasis upon rhetoric, that classical idea of words, language, style through rhetoric, and then a huge emphasis on the moral character of the students. They want to graduate moral, virtuous, ethical students, and they insist on certain kinds of behavior in the school, which you probably do too. But in America, the reason classical Christian schools, I think, have become so successful in America, they're growing so fast, is that it's really impossible to teach a classical education in a multicultural society. So everybody has to kind of decide. We're going through a big crisis in America right now 
because the state schools are teaching things that many Americans find abhorrent, terrible. I'll give you one example and then we'll go. I have a, my niece's daughter in, in, in South Carolina, which is a conservative state, or regarded as a conservative state. She sent her five-year-old little girl off to kindergarten year before first year, right? And the little girl came home the first week of school and she looked at her mother and she said, Mommy, am I a boy or a girl? And the mother was like, what kind of a question is that? You know perfectly well what you are. That's not what my teacher said. My teacher said I can be either a boy or a girl. I don't have to be a girl. And the mother was like, your teacher said that? Yeah, she said we all can, we, that's something that we all, we all can decide that for ourselves. Now I don't know how you feel about that, but from a Christian mother's perspective, that is a shocking piece of, that's a shocking lesson to be imposed upon her five-year-old child who is now questioning her own sexuality, right? Maybe later, maybe much later, those questions can arise. But part of the, uh, to me, you don't have to be even a Christian to find that difficult or wrong. Because the point to me is you, you answer children's questions when they are asking them. You don't impose answers on children before they've reached an age where they're really interested in asking them. And now that she has been, put, something has been put in this little girl's mind which questions who God created her to be. And that's a serious, but this is being taught, this is a public school taught in a public school. So if you want to know why Christians often pull their children out of the public schools, it's those kinds of lessons that they're being taught. And now, of course, schools officially are teaching lessons like white privilege, uh, intersectionality, other kinds of things that are Yes, it's true. Whites have enjoyed privileges in America that uh, in spite of our laws and everything else, it's, look, we're a great majority in that country, so it's easier to be white than it is to be, say, black. But the fact is, is that if you look at success rates in America, the Asians are the most successful group of people. I'm sure if we looked at just Estonians, Estonians would be much more successful than the average American, right? So it depends. Jamaicans, people from Jamaica who are people of color, they are more successful than the average Americans in terms of their income, their, their st stature, their status. But, but African Americans, those who grew up in America, whose ancestors were slaves, they do have a lower income, et cetera, et cetera. Although many of them are very famous, powerful people. Okay? But the point I'm making is if you go to a school where you are told that your success depends upon your color, your white color, that's not a lesson that many of us want our children taught. And even if the intention is good, the lesson is bad. Because they then see themselves growing up. I mean, America has always prided itself in being a country that allows you know, that allows everybody to come and be successful if they work hard and they remain on the right side of the law, right? It's always, and there's always been that positive element, but there's also always been, with that, prejudice, the kinds of things that humans engage in. But to start teaching young people at an early age, well, that's really not what America's about. It's really about prejudice. It's about keeping some people down because of the color of their skin. Well, we don't know, we don't know where that's going. We don't know how that's going to end up in terms of the development of our society, but it can't be very good. That's my view of it. We're going to have to tear down the Washington Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, all those things because all those men were slaveholders. It, you know, we can't we can't hold people guilty for what they did hundreds of years ago. 
based upon more enlightened ideas. And I, as I remind my friends who are like, you know, who feel this way, I said, yeah, in 200 years from now, they're going to be looking at you and thinking you were a monster, because that's what happens. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Class dismissed. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was a joy to be with you. I particularly like the Estonian answers. <laughs>